evening, I would like to share with you a message entitled National versus International God. National versus International. One of the things that excites me most uh, about ICC is the fact that we are an international church. Um, it's amazing how many people, just as we have prayed for our wonderful family who are going to, uh, to the Middle East right now from Italy, and it, we have had so many such people passing through the congregation, and that has resulted in a massive network that we have literally around the world spreading all the six continents. That's awesome. Seriously, the, the, the reach of ICC, um, you've got to just wait until you get to heaven <laughs> to be surprised at how amazing it is. But you know, it's not just ICC, it is really the kingdom of God. Two scriptures I want to bring to your focus. The first one is from the book of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. I'm not going to refer to it here, but I want to just test your knowledge because almost every one of you should know at least the gist of the message of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. That's what we call the Great Commission sometimes. Can anybody tell me what he says? Go into Denmark. Go into Denmark. Go into Denmark. Go Jesus says, all power and all authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go into the world. That word, world, is very important. Sometimes, sometimes it says, go into all the nations. The word in the Greek is actually the word ethnos, which talks about ethnicity. It's not about geography. It's about people groups. It's very important. And then in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, what does it say in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8? How you're being tested, right? So easy to quickly look at the Bible. It's about going into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right? Now, it, why am I bringing focus to these two scriptures? It's because you've got to understand that our God, the God that we serve, is a God of the nations. He's not just a God of Israel. It's very important for us to understand that. He revealed himself obviously to Abraham, but the purpose is he said, I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing to others, to all the nations. Now, this can be a little bit of a challenge for us because we are made of different cultures, different languages, different nationalities we come from, and quite often the, the reason why we have a nationality is because of the ways in which we do things. We are habitual creatures. We like to have a certain tradition, a form of doing things. Uh, the way we eat, the food we eat. Yesterday I had a... Once a year we have this neighborhood gathering. So uh, last night we had this neighborhood gathering. And you know, we have different uh, neighbors from different parts. One has got a Vietnam background, one has a Thai background, and then we have the different Danes from Yulan and Shilan and so on. And so as we gather, we, we all bring some food. And it's interesting because everybody brings, naturally, the food that they are most used to. And then when we sit down and we eat together, we try different people's food and different, even though we are all, you know, living in Denmark, everyone has their own tradition. In fact, even when we come to eating, we have different traditions. Some parts of the world, you, you eat with a fork and knife. Some parts of the world, you eat with chopsticks. Some part of the world, you eat with your hands. How many of you, where you come from, you eat with your hands? Oh, you even brought your hands with you. <laughs> now, it's amazing because we have these, these uh, differences, the important thing, of course, is the Food has to get into you, that's it. You know, the most important thing, it's cooked in a hygienic way so that you can continue to eat and stay alive. Now, but the way in which we do it is where it demarcates our culture. When we say, oh, this house, we do it this way, this culture, this country, we have these differences. The fact is that we are all human, we all belong to the human race, but we have our cultures, our languages, our nationalities. So that's what kind of separates us from each other. 
Likewise, when, uh, the, when God revealed himself to Israel, you've got to understand that at that time, in the, in, the, in the Jewish mindset, he was very much the God of Israel. In other words, if you wanted to have anything to do with this God as a Gentile who wants to become a Jew or a proselyte, what you have to do first and, all, first and foremost is to learn Hebrew. You have to. And then, of course, you, if you want to, 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 to convert into Judaism, you've got to be born again. It's a process. First of all, you learn Hebrew. You, you, let's say, imagine uh, I come from Singapore and I go to Israel and I say, Oh, this God of yours is wonderful and uh, I, I want to get to know Him. He says, Oh, first of all, you have to learn the language. And then I have to learn the culture. The language and culture always comes hand in hand. That's why we have a challenge even today in Denmark among immigrants, especially when it comes to this big word we call integration. Are you with me? Because we expect that you have learned the language, therefore you have to understand the culture. And it's a big difference because you can learn the language without having nothing to do with the culture. It's any, this is a big challenge. So anyway, you go to Israel, you learn, you learn Hebrew, you, you understand the Torah, you in fact have to memorize the portions of scriptures. After you've memorized it, then it comes to a procession where you go through uh, this process of being born again. What happens is uh, you have the rabbis, they will take you into the river and uh, you know, you've know got to get shaved first and foremost, uh, especially applied to the men, totally shaved, head, hair, eyebrows, everything, no hair on your body and then you are literally without any clothes because there are people covering you with clothes, they bring you into the river and then you go into the water and one of the rabbis will stick his hand into your mouth because when you go into the river they want you to open your mouth so the water goes into your mouth as well and then finally you stand up and then the rabbi who's standing in the bank will say now you are born again that's the understanding of being born again so this setting is where they say now you've been converted into that's why there was a conversation between Nicodemus and, 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 and Jesus. Can you remember this, this conversation of being born again? Yeah. Because Jesus looked at Nicodemus, he's a rabbi. You know, he's the one who stands in the bank and now you're born again. So Jesus told Nicodemus, you got to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what? I'm born a Jew. He says, how else can I be born again? I'm going to go back into my mother's womb. Then Jesus said, no, you don't understand. You're going to be born of the spirit and of water. He was talking about a spiritual birth. So, for, for the Jews. So when they learn the language, they learn the culture, they enter into the country, now they begin to go back to their country, they, they follow the rituals, so that they feel now I'm, you know, worshipping the God of Israel. So in the mind of the Jew, in that time, it was all about you converting to my nationality, my culture, my language, my style of eating, what we eat and what we don't eat, what is kosher and what is not kosher, and so therefore now. But all along, God's idea to Israel is that I'm not just your God. I'm not here just to get the whole world to become Jew. And there's nothing wrong with the Jews, don't get me wrong. Last Sunday we had a wonderful message to explain to you about the, the conflict that in Israel. But God's idea is that I want to be a God of the nations. I've always been a God of the nations. All along from Garden of Eden. From the Garden of Eden, God shows Himself to be a God of love, a God of care, a God of providence, a God of justice, and also a God of redemption. Isn't that wonderful? From the Garden of Eden. But after the flood, you realize that God realized I'm trying to reach out because God's the one when Adam and Eve sinned, it was God who came up to them. It, it was Him reaching out to them. And after the flood, it was like, you know, this God was trying to reach to the whole globe and He says, the strategy is now changed. I'm going to reach out to one man. And through this one man comes the Messiah. From the Messiah, I'm going to save this entire planet. So this particular man happened to be Abraham at that time, not even Abraham. And God said, Abraham literally means in Hebrew, Exalted, proud father, somebody who's proud. But Abraham or Abraham uh, literally means father of many nations. Not one nation. I always wondered why God added Ham to Abraham's name. And yet he was still kosher. 
hand. He put hand on, on Abraham, then he becomes Abraham, but he's still kosher. Anyway, it's interesting. But now, this I, the, 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 the whole story of Israel maybe the, can be best described in the story of Jonah. We all love the story of Jonah and the big fish. And I'm sure all the kids that we just released and said, go, uh, have heard this in different versions. Some people say that it was a big whale. And some say, no, no, it could have been a big white shark, whatever it was, uh, that came and swallowed Jonah. But the idea of Jonah's story was that he's a prophet called to prophesy, and God told him to go to Nineveh. You've got to remember, Nineveh is now another country, another tribe, another people. And Jonah was like, who cares about these people? They are worshipping other gods anyway. Let them die. That was his attitude. He said to if they want to save, if they want to get uh, to know our God, let them come to Jerusalem and worship. It was always about going to Zion. It was always about going to the Mount of God rather than us going out. Are you with me? That's the attitude that they had. So Jonah finally decided, I'm not going to go. You want me to go to them? No way. He decided to go the opposite direction. And you know the rest of the story, how God threw a shipwreck and down the whale and three days later, after three days, the guy was, he, I would rather die than to do God's will. After three days, still breathing, underwater, dark, oily. I have no clue how on earth he lived. <laughs> he finally decides, okay, whatever. You want me to preach, I'll preach. And then the fish goes and throws him up in the banks of Nineveh. He comes out and he decides, okay, I've got to do my job. So he goes up and he tells the king, this is what God says you got to do. And finally the king decides, we're going to repent. And, and he makes an extraordinary move because he says everybody has to fast. Everybody was compulsory fasting. Nobody, animals, servants, king, everyone. And so God says, wow, you actually listened. I will hold back my judgment. I'm not going to judge. During that period of time, Jonah got so upset. He said, that's why I didn't want to preach. Because you're merciful God. You're going to save these people. That was the, the attitude. The, the, the attitude of Jonah sums up basically that which was going on uh, among uh, the Hebrews at that time. Because in their mind, it's like, this is the way it is. If you want to be one of us, you got to get circumcised. And that's why circumcision was a very big discussion in the early church. And the kind of food you ate. Because it was all about culture rather than this concept and understanding that God is not a national God. He's a God of the people. All people. And it's sad, it's really sad, the damage that was done. Now, let's take it one step further from... Let, okay, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit more. That's why when we talked about Pentecost, even on the, on the day of Pentecost, we were talking about it here. But just, just a little reminder. That was why for the worshippers in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, this is like 50 days after the entire uh, death, burial, resurrection, ascension is taking place. And now all of a sudden, the, 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 all these worshippers from around the world, all speaking their own language, but these are converts to Judaism. They came there because they have learned. It's not that you've got to learn Hebrew. You've got to go through the entire process of being uh, sensitized to their culture, to the style of eating, circumcision, be born again. And then all of these people are very proud. You know, they come from different parts of the world. It's almost like, let's see how good is your Hebrew kind of a thing. Do you understand? So everybody's there from different parts. And all of a sudden, the, the Spirit of God comes upon the disciples. About 120 of them in the upper room when we go to Israel for the tour in October. Those of you who are going with us, we will go to the upper room. It's very interesting. Uh, it's very nice. It's still there, that place called the upper room. And you can see uh, physically how the, the noise was there. The windows were open and they were wondering where the wind is coming from. And so during that period, it was where they saw the Jewish people praising Almighty God in their language. And they were like, hang on a minute. This, I, hey, I went to such trouble to become a Jew, and you are now praising God in my language? It was 
God was saying something. When Jesus died, the, 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 the curtain in the temple, according to the uh, Bible, was torn in two. And this is not ordinary curtain. It was about one inch thick. It's a very thick damask curtain. And it's like 40 feet tall, 10 feet wide. It was torn from top to bottom. It was torn. Because God says, my presence is not meant to be just down here in the Holy of Holies. It's for the world. So the message Jesus has is that I am a God for everybody, not just Israel, not just the temple. And when the message came where everybody could hear that, hey, we are hearing our God being praised in different tongues. God is saying, I want to be praised. I want to be praised by this planet, by different tongues. And all of us have what we call a heart language. A heart language as well as the language that we were brought up in. Most of us in Texas, how many of you here speak more than one language? Can I see your hands? My goodness, it's almost every one of you. <laughs> I was uh, born and raised, uh, this, 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 uh, uh, my father obviously is from southern part of India, my mother from Malaysia, so this week, Ulf had sent me a text, you know, that says, Happy Independence Day. And I was like, wow, wonderful, thank you. But there was a flag behind, you know, and, I, and then I wrote back to him and I said, what flag is this, by the way? <laughs> and then he writes back to me, he said, it's India. And I was like, oh, wow, thanks, I mean, congratulations to my ancestors. <laughs> because, you know, I, I wasn't born there, so obviously I had to, and so many flags to recognize. Uh, you, you, you expect that, coming from, from Singapore, being born and raised, we spoke to my, only my mom, our, our mother tongue which is Tamil, South Indian language. But besides my mom, my brothers and sisters, we were all, you know, raised in Singapore, so English was the language we used at home, even among the siblings. And my neighbors were Malays, and so when I was playing with them, I spoke to them in Malay, and my uh, other friends were Chinese, uh, so we had a common street language called Hokkien, so I speak to them in Hokkien. So I grew up speaking English and, uh, as the main language, and then Chinese a little bit, Malay a little bit, and then uh, Tamil to my mom. When we came to Denmark, I learned this strange language called Danish, which uh, I never knew existed. I thought, they, honestly, before I came to Denmark, I didn't even know because our geography has nothing to do with Denmark. I didn't even know Denmark was a country. I thought Danish was something you ate. <laughs> Danish pastries, or Danish pork, and Danish butter, and then suddenly I came to Denmark as a country? Whoa! And I was even surprised when I was here, why am I here? Because statistically speaking, 97% of Danes are, are Christians, at least statistically. So I was like, what am I doing here? Then I came and understand the culture and so on. But the interesting thing is that until today, when I speak, uh, even though I have Indian DNA, English happens to be my language. That's my heart language. And I tell you the secret about your heart language. Normally when you count, try to just for one minute mentally count one to ten. Just mentally, without mentioning. Can you do it? That language that you're using to count not just the numbers. That's your heart language. That's the one that you sometimes pray. You know, you can always speak very, no matter how diplomatic you are and so on, the moment uh, somebody kicks you maybe accidentally and all the word that comes out, that's your heart language. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hide that. You can pretend your actions, your reactions, you can't. The reaction, the, the moment you start to, the, you know, all those wonderful flowery words comes out, that's your heart language. That becomes your yeah. So, and basically what God is saying is that I want my people to worship me in that heart language because I am a God of nations. It's not that God is sick and tired of Hebrew, it's not about that. If you're a Jew, you're born again, or maybe you're not a Jew, but maybe you are from... Sweden or maybe from, from, from Switzerland, but you're born and raised in Israel and Hebrew is your heart language. Fine, it's okay. What God wants is that He's trying to say, I want to have a relationship and I want my relationship to be based on you, not on the traditions, not on the cultures, but on this heart language, this communication, just like a child would cry out to his or her father or mother, Abba, Father. Abba is because of the Aramaic and the, and, and the Hebrew, when they call their, their parents, they call them Abba. And every language is a different way of calling your, 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 your parents. In Danish, it's Moa or Fa. 
That's how you call your, your father. Uh, I don't know what it is in other languages. What, what is it in some of your languages? How do you call your mom or your dad? Papa, mama, papa, mama. Papa, mama. What language is that? French. French? Creole. Creole. Creole, how do you call dad, dad, your dad or your mom? Mama, papa. Mama, papa. In, 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 in Tamil, uh, uh, it's only to my mom I do that, but you know, I call everybody else. In Tamil, um, uh, we call the mother Amma, and we call the father Appa. <laughs> and in Malay, it's Mama, Papa. <laughs> In Urdu, what is it in Urdu? Ma, Ami. Ami. Urdu is Ami and Hindi is Ma. Ma in Hindi and Urdu is Ami. What about uh, Chinese, Lydia? In Chinese, how do you call your mom and your dad? Papa, Mama. Papa, Mama. What about Japan? Japanese. How do you do it in Japanese? Mom, uh, mom and dad. Otosa, Okasa. Once again? Otosa and Okasa. Otosa? Okasa. Okasa. <laughs> what about what about in Italian? Mama Papa. Mama Papa. <laughs> it's interesting. That 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 language, you know, that, that hard language that comes. That, 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 that's, that, that's what God is saying. Listen, I, I don't want you to be caught up in all the rituals and and all the, the, the traditions. God had preserved a nation called Israel for the sake of having the Messiah come to the planet. And his entry point was not just for the nation. There is an agreement. God has made a covenant with David. God has made a covenant with Moses. And made a covenant with, with, with uh, Abraham. There is a reason, a purpose for that. But in the meantime, he wants us to know that while I'm dealing with this agreement I have, I am not just for this nation. I am a God of the nations. I've got a plan for every one of you. Your language, your tongue, your nation, and your heart belongs to me. That's awesome. What, 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 where we have gone wrong is that when we had the gospel spread out of Israel and he went to, to Jerusalem. That's why it's so important for you to understand. Because God, and he said that when the Spirit comes on you, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. My witnesses like you stand in the court. And then he says specifically to them. He says, when the Spirit you can't do this in your strength. You can't do this in your mind. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you can only do this by the Spirit. And He says specifically, you will be my witnesses. He says, in Jerusalem. And all of the Jews are like, yeah, perfect. No problem, Jerusalem. Yeah, we're used to that. In Judea. And they were like, huh? Judea is like the West Bank today. Because that's, that's where the, uh, uh, the, the Judeans, the, 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 the Jews felt that the Judeans were like second class, second grade. It's almost like we have uh, in Denmark sometimes we have discussions about Yulen and Shilen. It's an ongoing discussion. All the people in Yulen think that Shilen is mm. All the people in Shilen think that Yulen is mm. <laughs> One time I was talking in, in, in a Bible school here in Denmark, you know, and I was trying to talk to them about the uh, land graph and, 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 and geography. And so in Yulen I was telling them, I said, just try to imagine. I said, try to imagine about, about war and land. I said, just imagine that tomorrow uh, Sweden decides that we are going to take Shelen. What will you do? Yeah, I was talking about this in, in, in Yulen. And then all the uh, youths would say, let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and I said, okay, 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 wrong illustration. Let's change, let's change the scenario. I said, let's imagine Germany decides to take Yulen. They said, oh, we will fight. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we, we have these differences. That, that was how the, the, the Jews looked at the Judeans. So Jesus says, I want, I want to, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, I want you to be the, uh, in, in Jerusalem and in Judea. And they were like, huh? Judeans? They, they go there. They should be coming to us. We are the big brother. And then he goes further. He says, Samaria. Samaria were even worse because they were the half cups. They were not even fully Jews. They were not even second grade. They were like the... You know, so a bit, you have 25% Jew and 25% uh, whatever, and so it was like, so, and Jesus, can you remember when Jesus was talking to the Samarit, uh, Samaritan woman by the well, yeah. and the disciples came, the reason why they were shocked is they were like, it's not because he was talking to a woman, it's because, what are you doing with a Samaritan? She's not even half, I mean, she's not even Judean, she's Samaritan. That was the, that was the attitude. That was 
being carried about. So therefore, it's very important for us to understand that for us to, to, to bring the gospel across is God will say Judea and Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. During Jesus' time, there was only one person that he reached out to, uh, and, and he went to this place called the Decapolis. Decapolis talks about the ten cities. This was the guy that was possessed by many, many demons. In fact, the Bible calls it legions. Legions means a lot. Alright, so this was a guy, in, according to the Bible, he was, you know, in the caves, hiding away, nobody could restrain him, whenever they restrained him, he broke the strains away, and he would cut himself with the rock and scream out. So Jesus came and he confronted the demon, and the man was delivered, he was saved, he put on his clothes and he told Jesus, let, let me follow you, let me follow you, I'm not your disciple. He said, no, 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 go back to your town, go back to your family, go back to your cities. And, and go and tell them about what the Lord has done for you. So he was the very first one who actually went to the Decapolis, the ten cities, to talk about. The idea that Jesus was here is not just for him to make a national monument of himself. Because he wants to be the God of the nations. Now what has happened is that when finally Christianity went out, in some ways he was forced out because the Jews were very much, come, come, let's, let's be together. And, and when the gospel was supposed to go out, in, in the early church, we had what we call the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was the, the first church, the early church. But finally, when the gospel had to go out, the church in Jerusalem wasn't the one doing it. It was hard for them. It was very difficult for them to actually be the mission's center. So in reality, it was a church in Antioch. Antioch was a cosmopolitan city where you had people from everywhere. All different colors, all different, because it was a port. Because it was a port, people were from. So that church in Antioch, that's where Paul was, ended up becoming a missions church, sending the message out to the rest of the known world at that time. Isn't that interesting? Jerusalem still struggled. And still they wanted to be the boss. Because then every time Paul went out, he had to come back and report to them what, what has happened. And they said, yes, but they have to be circumcised. And Paul said, no! I don't understand. It's not our culture. God is looking for circumcision in the heart. He says, okay, then they have to eat kosher. No! Okay, we will we'll tell them not to eat food with blood in it. But don't put this restraint on them. Don't put our tradition, our culture on them. Are you following? It's very, I mean, it's so important to understand God is not a national God. Now, what happens right after that? We can go down church history. Christianity spread around the world, let's say from Britain and from America and from Europe, different parts of the world. Unfortunately, unfortunately, what happens is that not just the gospel message was spread, but a lot of the culture of that nation, unfortunately, was also spread. Are you thinking? I found the churches in some most remote villages in Asia, in Africa, and see the church, and it's like every building is built like the way it is, and suddenly you have these people that was like, it's like a soil, a soil time, it's like, what is this doing here? He said, oh, the missionaries came. And then you go inside, and it's pews, just, just like we used to have pews, and even an organ, these people don't even know how to play the organ. They are playing maybe combos and stuff like that, and I'm like, how interesting. It's not just a message. But it's like, if you're going to worship this God, you have to do it. Are you following? The culture. It's interesting because I remember when I was in Pakistan, you know, I traveled a lot in missions. One time I was in Pakistan, church was on a, on a Friday. It wasn't on a Sunday. It was because that's the, that's the holiday, that's their Sunday. Friday is a day. And so I was there, and then I went to, the, the, the missionary brought me around and said, oh, now, today is church. I said, but it's Friday. He said, yeah, but church is Friday here. I said, oh, and, and, I, and I had to adjust. I was like, oh, uh, Friday, okay, okay, this is okay. <laughs> I had a big, big challenge. And then we went in uh, to the church, everybody was seated on the floor. You guys are lucky you have a chair. Why don't you take the chair? <laughs> See, well, because that's how they do it in their tradition. All the men were sitting together and all the women together. And of course, the woman had the wheels and all. And they had all the traditional instruments, and they were playing the songs, you know, with all the Indian 
Pakistani, you know, music. I was sitting down there thinking to myself, I said, wow. And when the guy was preaching, and he was a, the missionary was not even a, a Pakistani, the missionary was a Chinese who spoke more Urdu, I don't even know Urdu, who spoke, you know, in their language, understands them. He was sitting down there preaching, and I was like, look at this Chinese guy. I don't know if you remember his name, Julian. That, that, that Chinese guy. I can't even remember his name right now. Um, he, Chong, Chong, something, Chong, Chi Chong. Yeah, yeah whatever, Chi Chong. Anyway, that's it. Uh, but, and I was amazed, I was looking at him, I was like, wow. Because the message was the same, the method is different, but the message was exactly the same as God. Love God, God wants to save you, you're going through a tough time, let me help you, let me pray for you. It was the same thing, but it was just done. So then I realized that, wow, here, look, he has contextualized the gospel. He didn't change. He didn't. And of course, there are other churches, don't get me wrong, there are other churches that are very uh, modern, very cultured. And so sometimes then denomination says, okay, if you want to be part of the church, you have to do it the Methodist way. You no, know, we have a methodological way. We have to do it the Baptist way. We have to do it the Catholic way. And we have to do it the Protestant with the Pentecost. The Catholic. What we are doing is we are bringing in a culture rather than the message doesn't make us any different from what the Jews were doing. You want this? My way. Whereas God says, it's for all of you. It's for all of you. He's not a national God. He's not a denominational God. He is an international God. And He wants to be God of the nation. Does it make any sense what I'm saying today? I'm very passionate about this because I do a lot of traveling and I see this repeated again and again and again all over the place. And what's supposed to say, sometimes we even have what we call church cultures, especially mega church cultures. We have, and don't get me, I'm not saying wrong with churches in the hundreds of the thousands. But what happens is that when you get so big, you can also manipulate how it's supposed to be done. And people have the impression that, so that is the way. And then they, 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 they travel, you know. I, I'm so happy that their family is always coming through. I pray to God that every family that passes through ICC and goes somewhere else, bring the, the message, not the method. Because we have our method too. We have a tradition where we welcome people, we give you a welcoming pack, and then uh, I don't think in heaven you're going to get a welcoming pack. In heaven you make it or you don't, full stop. <laughs> <laughs> your welcoming pack or your baptism certificate is not going to mean nothing. <laughs> if you get to bring your baptism certificate at all. But the message of being connected to God because He loves you and He wants to. So how do we apply this? How do we apply this? The, the, the church in <coughs> Antioch had a challenge because they were so different. And a church like ICC, we are an international church. We are so different. We have in our midst, as we are standing together today, either a recipe for success which expresses the, 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 the international, you know, the global God, or we have a recipe for disaster if each of us insists that it should be done this way. In other words, each of us stand up and says, I have the copyright to church, or I have the copyright to God. This is how it's supposed to be done. That would be a tremendous disaster. And sometimes we hold on. To, get me. Don't, 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 just, just try to follow me because I, I want to provoke you. I want to challenge you with the truth. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Sometimes we hold on very ardently and very dogmatically to our traditions and our culture more than we do to the gospel itself. Because that's how... I've been used to. And believe me though, older you get, the harder it becomes to change. <laughs> That's because we're creatures of habit. That's because we're creatures of habit. Now, we had our church, usually we have our church uh, service uh, head down in the, in the hall, in the main hall, and the past couple of uh, July, we had the service down in the uh, floor below. We had the seating arrangement this way, and then we had the seating arrangement this Sunday, we are up here like this. 
It's amazing how many of you, no matter how you got a holiday or whatever, when you come back, you like it or not, you almost automatically gravitate to almost the same geographical location where you're seated right now. <laughs> It's amazing. Yeah. Creatures of habit. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's just part of our DNA. It has to do with security. You, you get a bit more secure with that. And that's just the way it is. <clears throat> and the fact is, when that is translated into your worship of God, and that habit becomes more important than the truth of the gospel, that's where we're trying to also do exactly what the Jews do, Take him away from being an international God and make him a national God, maybe even a cultural God. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. A traditional God. And he's challenging people. And what, what can change is what can set me free? Believe me, you cannot do it yourself. It's only by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit. And what brings about that manifestation is your own personal private relationship with God, Amen. not the traditions, not the liturgies, not the rituals. So you've got to be able to separate between the two. That's why the Bible says the word of God is sharper than the double-edged sword. It can spread between the two and show you what it is. And that's where the help of the Holy Spirit will come and says, Lord, help me set me free. Set me free. Hallelujah. Amen. Nothing wrong with culture. We need it. Otherwise, we will be one confused bunch. Or we'll all be like zombies. <laughs> but just don't let the culture overrule your relationship with God. So this, in conclusion, let me just mention this. What is, how do we go about it? In a setting like this, in ICC, the rule number one is learn to disagree in an agreeable way. Somebody else is different, let it be. Because God is a God of variety. Don't try and make that no, no, you have to do it this way. Oh, you do it that way? Wonderful, good for you. Yesterday we were eating together. Uh, last night I told you this neighborhood gathering. One couple, they used to live, in fact, they used to be our neighbors. They've already moved to somewhere in the northern part of Shilin. But every year they come back for this gathering because they really treasure the relationship we have. Uh, elderly couple. The man was, a, uh, he's retired now, but he was a driver for the. Uh, Densky Banks, big character. And he was a great guy, and then, so uh, one of the neighbors had cooked uh, some Chinese dish with some very strong chili. So the wife was sitting opposite, and he was sitting right next to me, and so he had taken the, the, the dish, and he had a lot of chili. He didn't know it was chili. He thought it was just, you know, you know, uh, some brown sauce or brun. So he took all of it. And so he had he put it all on the right and he was just about to just about to put it in his mouth and then the wife from across the head is that is that the master It is strong, it is strong, it is strong. <laughs> so he pulls back. And so he begins to like, oops, and uh, now I uh, you know I learned something new. So it's important for us to understand that it's okay, it's fine, it's different. Uh, and he didn't stand up and shout how, why did you serve something strong? It was just okay, that's something strong, I gotta watch out. So likewise we're different. And it's okay. Somebody is, you know, making this. Let them be. Secondly, don't try to intimidate another person with your, listen to me carefully, Christian culture. Christian. Not just culture, but in my country, this is how we used to do it. In my church, or in that church, are you following me? So does that mean that God only answers prayers in your question in your country? That was exactly the argument the Samaritan woman had with Jesus. The moment the Samaritan woman discovered that he's a prophet, he said, You see, we have a problem. Because your father says that we have to worship in Jerusalem. My father says that we have to worship. So all of a sudden it was about where do we worship? And then he says, Listen to me, I'll tell you the truth. The time is coming and now it's come. Those who worship God worship in spirit and in truth. It's not Jerusalem, it's not Judea, it's not Yulang, it's not uh, Stockholm. It's spirit and it's true. Awesome, man. Eh? Awesome. Another thing is this. Do what, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, you find there's a group of people. Paul went from place to place to this. Paul talked to one group called the Bereans. 
The Bereans were a very interesting people. He went and he had discussions with them about the Bible. And the Bible says specifically that these Bereans, they would go back home and they would search the scriptures. Because they were all scrolls. It is not like us in these days, you know, you take out your iPhone and you start to do a little search. They had scrolls, you know, a lot of them. And it's all over the place. They had libraries and synagogues where they kept them. So the, the Bereans would listen to what Paul said. They would go back and they had literally to carry this big wooden scrolls, put them up on places, unfold them little by little, try to read and figure out is what this guy is saying in the scriptures. And they only had the Old Testament. So do that. Whenever you hear something, do a little search. Don't just buy things face value. Even if you're hearing it from me. Doesn't matter who you're hearing from. Go back home and search the scriptures. Because that will be life to you. It will be your own personal revelation. Which should be what this guy spoke about. Now, the next thing is reach out to people in the spirit of love. And also, with, a, with an inquisitive of wanting to learn something new. You never will go on a deficit in knowledge. It's always good to know. And I thank God for my exposure and travels around the world. I've learned so much. I've learned an incredible deal of understanding that there are more things, the more ways of doing things. You take the whole planet and put it together, you have two groups of people. You have what we call the optimistic and we have the pessimistic. The optimistic is always saying, why not? And the pessimistic is always saying, why? <laughs> Big difference. And so it's important to ask yourself, how can I be somebody that can learn and benefit from you? Last but not least, don't criticize or complain whenever something is different, but rather cultivate a relationship with God and say, teach me. What can I learn from this? Because you are an international. You're not a national God. Amen? Amen. So get, get rid of this uh, critical spirit and this spirit that says, Oh, but this is that way. Oh, but there we do it here. Drop that off. And become more global in your thinking. Say, God, what can I learn? What can I learn? Maybe this person eats something different. You know, wears something different. Sings in a different way. Uh, today I was standing here and I was really happy because I was just watching the worship team that was here. We have a Filipino standing here worshipping. And then we have right next to her a person from Zimbabwe. And then we had, were you there too? A British. And then we had a Singaporean offspring born in Denmark. <laughs> and then we have a Japanese playing the piano. Oh, how beautiful. How international. What a picture, what a picture of that we get to have. Yeah. And, and, and the advantage of being in a church, is that there are challenges, don't get me wrong, there are challenges because you're constantly being challenged by people coming and going and different cultures and nationalities and styles and lingo. And somebody says something and you're like, what, 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 what are you saying? Because we speak in different uh, accents and... But the beauty of it is, wow, this is an image of what God is going to do in large scale in heaven. Amen. It's a journey that we take together. It's soul food from the heart. In God, we're united in our differences. It's a place of getting in touch with God, others and your destiny. Come and visit ICC, the International Christian Community, a church where great things come together. Over